Something has crept into our assumptions about Jesus that makes it almost impossible to relate to him, not to mention love him. They say crept because it's not been a conscious decision. Few of the things that shape our convictions really are. I think much of the creep has happened ironically as a result of our attempts to love and to revere Christ. But crept in this notion has, and it has done great damage to our perceptions of him and to our experience of him. It's the notion that Jesus was really kind of pretending when he presented himself as a man. Welcome back to the special Easter podcast here at Ransomed Heart. I'm John Eldridge, and I'm so glad you're with us today here on Thursday I'm reading from Beautiful Outlaw here to get us started into what is going to be the four most remarkable days that have ever been lived by a human being on this planet. Let me continue for a moment. We who worship Jesus Christ hold fast to the belief that he was God, very God of very God, as the Nicene Creed states. The heroic actions and miraculous powers of Jesus' life attest to it. So, when we read what we would call the more human moments, we feel that Jesus was sort of mm, cheating. With a nod and a wink, we know what's really happening is that Einstein has dropped in to take the first grade math quiz. Mozart is playing a measure in the kindergarten song flute choir. I mean, after all, we're talking about Jesus here. The guy walked on water, raised Lazarus from the dead. He never broke a sweat, right? But then what do you make of that terrible sweat in Gethsemane? I think the actions of this week are fairly well known. I think they're very well known to disciples of Christ. And so what we've been doing in the previous four podcasts and then picking up here today on Thursday is that we're looking for the inner experience, the inner life of Jesus during these days and nights, days and nights unlike any other day or night ever upon the earth. Saturday, he came to Bethany. Sunday, he rode into Jerusalem to the cheering crowds. Monday, he cursed the fig tree and cleared the temple, which is perhaps a second cleansing if the one in John is taken to be the first. Tuesday and Wednesday are filled with teaching, with pretty sober warnings about the end of the age, and with numerous conflicts and confrontations with the Pharisees, and also with his sorrow over Jerusalem. Each night, he has left town and walked the two or so miles back to Bethany to stay with friends. Last night, Mary anointed him with oil. But now, It is Thursday, and he will not return to Bethany again. The great drama is rushing forward at this point. Jesus' death is less than 24 hours away. Let's pick up the story in Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go, and make preparations for us to eat the Passover Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. And so they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This is a very, very poignant sentence in a very, very rich scene. The disciples still don't fully grasp everything that's about to unfold. I mean, they won't begin to grasp the fullness of it until years after Christ has been crucified and raised from the dead and and that they've walked more deeply in the revelation of all that he did. 
here at this moment, they are what they believe to be part of a revolution. They're hoping, in fact, that as the crowds hoped on Palm Sunday, that Christ is perhaps going to usher in the kingdom now. They they believe him to be the Messiah. They're just not quite clear on, on God's approach to these things. And so you have a group of very close friends, a group of men who have sort of thrown their lot in together, spent three years together, much of it on the road, nights in the woods, campfires, conversations, traveling here and there. You know, they've seen it all. And they sense the tension. They sense something is escalating here. And there is this absolutely beautiful scene. It's like the calm before the storm. It's like the deep breath before the plunge, where Jesus and the disciples are reclining, having the the Passover meal around the table, and Jesus opens his heart to them. And he looks around the table, and he looks at the countenances of his friends there by candlelight, and he says, how I have longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus is a man who is filled with deep longings. And how beautiful is that? You see, longings longings are probably the deepest expression of the human heart. When someone begins to open up their longings to you, they are opening up their heart of hearts to you. We long for love. We long for beauty, for laughter, for joy. We long for connection. We long for redemption. This is what it means to be a human being. This is what sets us apart from the rest of creation is this deep heart that God has put within us. And the heart is often most deeply expressed through longings. And so we have this incredibly poignant moment where Jesus is opening his heart to his disciples. He just expresses his longing heart, his humanity. And then from Mark 14. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, the new covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, I tell you the truth. He adds this little afterwards. I mean, he's just presented to them the first communion that's going to be celebrated for thousands of years afterwards all over the world by followers of Christ. This is the very first one. It's the very first moment. This is my blood. This is my body. And then this very poignant moment where he adds an afterward. He says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. I'm just so curious to know, what was his mood as he said that? Why did he include that? He's already opened his longings to us. Is this another? It can't just be a fact. He's not just giving them a fact of, oh, by the way, I'm actually not going to drink wine again until we're all together in my father's kingdom and act four has begun. It can't just be a piece of information. It's got to be something that's coming out of the deep heart of Jesus. And I wonder if, again, he's just relishing in the moment. Does he take a long drink? Does he hold it in his mouth? Does he swallow it and savor it and say, "Mm, I tell you the truth, it's going to be a long time until I taste this again. And something, again, of the beauty of Jesus, of being willing to fast. He is fasting from wine until he gets to raise that cup with all of us in the kingdom of heaven. And then Christ, of course, begins to teach them in the upper room discourse in the gospel of John about his departure. And he says the kindest thing to them. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. I mean, who loves like this? Who lives like this? He knows that his torture and execution is hours away. And yet he's lingering with friends. He's opening his heart to them. And then he comforts their hearts. It's just astounding. And then they leave and they go to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is, I think, the one story where it seems that the church allows something of the humanity of Jesus. Let's pick it up as recorded in Matthew 26. 
And then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Pause. The beauty of this moment, I don't think I'm going to be able to capture, but I pray that the Spirit brings it to you by revelation. I mean, you have the darkness of the night. You have them in the olive grove. You have Christ needing to pray. He needs to pray. And and now you begin to see something of just the profound weight of this on Jesus. He's not a superman. He's not a robot. He's not just coasting through life. This isn't just Einstein, you know, taking the first grade math quiz. This is not easy for him. In fact, he says that he's anguished and overwhelmed. And and then this beautiful moment of stay here, stay here and keep watch with me. There are defenders of the gospel and of the glory of Christ in our world today that get really upset when you suggest that God has longings and when you suggest that God needs anything from us. They fear that it diminishes the almighty, all-sufficiency of God. But that's just simply not true. It's not the revelation that you get in Jesus Christ. The scriptures make it clear. Hebrews 1 says that Jesus is the physical representation of the invisible God. And here you see a God who is filled with longing, a God who has a very, very deep heart, And a God who says to his friends, please stay with me. We saw a piece of that when Mary anointed him. That Jesus was deeply ministered to by Mary's actions. And then you see it here in his request that Peter, James, and John stay with him. And he just aching for their companionship, their support. This would be a phenomenal thing to enter into your heart would be the revelation that You have something that God longs for, that you minister to his heart like Mary did, that your companionship means something to him as it does here in Gethsemane. And then you recall the story. He goes off to pray, returns to his disciples, finds them sleeping, and he says, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? You know, the pain the loneliness, the disappointment of that, and then a warning, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then he goes away a second time and prays, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. I mean, you see the deep, deep, deep turmoil, the deep battle that's going on within the heart of Jesus to do the will of the Father, and yet he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to do this. Who would? I think that Christ has some inclination of what this is going to be. It's not merely the torture, and it's not merely the execution. It's what's going to be laid on him at the execution. He is the Passover lamb, the atonement. The sins of the world are, for a moment, going to be laid upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And I just think about how I can barely handle the revelation of my own sin. It's so heartbreaking and sometimes absolutely soul-crushing. And then you consider what it would be like to have the sins of the world 
laid upon you. So, I mean, Jesus is, he is in agony here in Gethsemane. And in the beauty of this moment of the, you know, battle of his own will to align with the will of the Father, you see his longings, you see his heart, you see his loneliness, his fear. This is not going to diminish our worship of Jesus Christ. This is only going to deepen our love and our devotion and our worship of him. This doesn't diminish his glory. Rather, it only increases it to realize that his humanity is real and that Jesus is not skipping steps. He's not skirting some of the more difficult issues. He is walking through this valley as no human being has ever walked through it before without dissociation, without detachment. Tomorrow he'll refuse the wine offered him on the cross. He won't be numbed by it. He faces it full on. There's a beautiful poem that I love. It's one of my favorite poems by Ezra Pound. It's called The Ballad of the Goodly Fair. And fair is a an old English word that means mate or companion. I want to read a, a portion of that. Have we lost the goodliest fare of all for the priests and the gallows tree? Aye, lover he was of brawny men, of ships and the open sea. When they came with a host to take our man, his smile was good to see. First let these go, quoth our goodly fare, or I'll see ye damned, says he. Aye, he sent us out through the crossed high spears, and the scorn of his laugh rang free. Why took ye not me when I walked about alone in the town, says he? Oh, we drank his hail in the good red wine when we last made company. No capon priest was the goodly fair, but a man o' men was he. I had seen him drive a hundred men with a bundle of cords swung free, and when they took the high and holy house for their pawn and treasury, if they think they have snared our goodly fare, they are fools to the last degree. I'll go to the feast, quote our goodly fare, though I go to the gallows tree. Thank you for joining us on these special Easter broadcasts. I'm John Eldridge, and you've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. Podcast.